Can you hear me now? Yes. Actually, the Jews are desirous of killing Jesus. Chronologically, uh, at the end of chapter 6, obviously chapter 7 follows in the book of John, and chapter 7, verse 1 says, After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee. He did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. So he's staying away from Jerusalem because their goal, as they're absolutely incensed with him, is to kill him. But killing Jesus isn't as easy as you might think. They haven't done this directly yet because he's too popular with the people. So they have to figure out ways to destroy him so they can somehow justify it. We're going to look in Matthew, but, or excuse me, Mark, but this account is also recorded in Matthew. And it's how we're told that the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus. So they're coming up to Galilee to take him on. In fact, they accuse him here. Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. And so this is why I think some of these scribes and Pharisees have traveled up to see Jesus. They're looking for something that they can accuse him with. Uh, they want to discredit him before the people. as That's an outstanding way to to undermine someone. They've already rendered their verdict. We know in John chapter 5, uh, they decided after he claimed to be God that they wanted to kill him. And so this has been in the works for a while. They've already made up their minds. Now they're looking for reasons to justify their conclusion. And this is a pharisaical attitude. And this could be a problem for all of us to one degree or another. It's not uncommon for someone to make up their minds in advance as to the character of a person. And when they firmly form their opinions, then they look for all the evidence they need to justify the conclusion they've already made. They certainly don't want to let facts get in the way of their opinion, and that's really what typifies the Pharisees. They don't want to hear the truth that will set them free, but they're having a hard time finding fault with Jesus, and so the next best option is to find fault with his associates. Guilt by association is always a good tactic to run someone down, and that's certainly what they're going to do here. Religious legalists and Pharisees are experts at this game. But, you know, we're not that bad at it either, let's be honest. Uh, you know, today we're going to see something uh, we all know well, though we might not recognize it as well as we could in our own lives. It's called hypocrisy. That's what makes us hypocritical. It's so easy for us to see the faults of others, and yet we look in the mirror and somehow <laughs> we just don't see them. I don't know why that is. Let me give you, but Jesus is going to make it very apparent in his discussion with the Pharisees and the crowd that it is totally a heart issue. Totally a heart issue. Hey, that's even better. Let me give you a couple of illustrations to think about here this morning. Let me introduce you to a person who attends our church. He attends every service we have, including special events. He offers to support the effort to go on mission trips. He regularly gives of his material blessings. He sings in the choir. He reads his Bible daily. He memorizes scripture. He always is here to pray when we gather corporately Wednesday nights. He will defend the Bible. He's a monotheist. He believes in heaven and hell. He never gets drunk, never visits inappropriate websites, never uses profanities. He's a family man. He loves this country. He votes the right way, whatever that is. His reputation in the community is stellar. People who know him admire him for all he does, and yet if he died today, he'd go straight to hell. Now, does that describe a hypocrite? Here's another one, and this one might be a little closer to home. One Sunday, a man sat through a church service, and then on the way home, he fussed about the sermon. <clears throat> he griped about the traffic. He complained about the heat and made a big fuss about how late the lunch meal was served. And then he bowed to pray, giving God thanks for the food. Well, his son was watching him all the way, and through this post-church experience. And just as they were beginning to pass the food, he said, Daddy, did God hear you when you left the church and started fussing about the sermon and about the traffic and about the heat? Father blushed and said, Well, yes, son, he heard me. And Well, Daddy, did God hear you when you just prayed for the food right now? And he said, Yes, he, he heard me. Well, which one did God believe? And that's a very good question, isn't it? It showcases, really, something that affects all of us. We're all hypocrites, and if you don't think you're one, well, let me just tell you you are. I'm just not going to sugarcoat it. And yet hypocrisy is just something that, it, well, it just is. And the word comes from the ancient Korean language. It was used to describe actors in a play. 
these actors would carry around different masks, and when something was supposed to be funny, they'd put up a mask with a smile on it, and when something was supposed to be sad, they'd put up a, a mask with a sad face on it. And so the, the word literally means one who wears a mask, and so it's used figuratively in our language today. It refers to people who pretend to be one thing when they're actually something else. It applies to people who say one thing and do another, which means we can all raise our hand, can we not? Absolutely. I mean, it's amazing, even in ways that we're usually not even aware of it. We want people to forgive us, but we will hold a grudge. We want people to be kind to us, and yet we'll run them into the ground. I mean, the list I could make is, is really endless. You know, some people claim there's too many hypocrites in church, and I always say they're not enough. And since we're all hypocrites, there's always room for one more, isn't there? Right? Makes sense? And people obviously say that because they're coming up with excuses why they don't want to go. But I did read where one preacher said, quote, it is better to spend a few hours with a hypocrite at church than to spend eternity with them in hell. <laughs> I'm not going to argue with that, right? One other one said, a hypocrite is, if a hypocrite is standing between you and God, the hypocrite is closer to God than you are. <laughs> oh, good humor. You know, but we can pretend to be you know, a classic is eighth grade girls, they pretend to be your friend when they're with you, and then as soon as they're with someone else, they trash you to no end, right? Eighth grade girls ever do that? Grown adults ever do that? Yeah, we do it, right? We're all guilty. And Jesus is not going to sugarcoat what he feels, how he feels about the Pharisees. He's just going to give them evidence. He's going to call them hypocrites. You know, at this point in the life of Christ, Jesus has proved that he is the Son of God. Those who have seen him are without excuse. They've witnessed some of the most amazing things. And yet the scribes and Pharisees can't stand it. And they're going to, I mean, these are mere men are going to come to the Son of God and not only falsely accuse him, and they're going to rebuke him. Crazy. Hypocrite. There's just one picture. Now, a Pharisee, and we've talked about this before, but this is, I thought I'd give a technical definition, and then there's the generic everyday definition. The Pharisee is a member of an ancient Jewish sect distinguished by strict observance to traditional and written law and commonly held to have pretensions to superior sanctity. Now, how that's word, when you call someone a Pharisee in our vernacular, it refers to a self-righteous person or a hypocrite. And so that's really how it's used. Now, with scribes, the scribes were the legal scholars of the day. They drew up the legal documents. They copied the Old Testament scripture. They devoted themselves to the study of the law. They were the ones to determine its application on daily life. And so they were the lawyers of the day, if you will, in different ways. And, and so and, um, they had their own, some of those scribes that were well noted had their own disciples and so forth. But they were the religious elite. They were in charge of teaching the people the truth regarding God. But they were opponents of grace. And it's always the case when the truth is preached, there's always those who are going to seek to hinder the truth. When Jesus walked on the earth, there were those who opposed him. We're going to see that today. Paul was opposed. And if you're willing to serve the Lord and stand on the grace of God, you will be opposed because that's the way it is. In fact, Jesus made this statement to warn the disciples on the eve of his crucifixion. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. The reason they hate you is because they hate me. You're an extension of me. That's all there is to it. Now, the Pharisees were known to their adherents, their strict adherents to their legalistic traditions, but they were hypocrites. They criticized their perceived faults in the Lord and his work. And yet they completely ignored their lack of obedience to those aspects which God said was important. And he's going to bring one of those to the forefront here in this passage. He's going to expose their hypocrisy in a very painful way. And you know, these truths haven't changed. So before you trash the Pharisees, it'd be good for all of us to maybe look in the mirror first. Because when you point the finger, three point back at you. And it doesn't matter really what is going on on the outside because God is looking at your heart. Right? That's how it is. You know, God measures our life.
by our hearts. Man looks on the outside, but God looks at the heart. Man's perception is imperfect. God's perception is 100% accurate and perfect in every way. So let's read the, you can follow along as I read the first five verses of Mark chapter 7. It says, And the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. And now when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they don't eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked Jesus, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with washed, unwashed hands? It's a nerve. And so these Pharisees and teachers come of the law, come from Jerusalem to see Jesus. They, de- they were coming to verify the fact that he was the Messiah. They were coming, as it were, to find a fly in the ointment, as it says. And to this end, they were masters. But apparently they witnessed the disciples eating bread without washing their hands. And this is a common activity of a self-righteous person. They fault find. They're on a fault finding mission. You know, it's interesting. They don't have enough guts to accuse Jesus of anything, so what do they got to do? They go for his disciples. They didn't bring a charge against Jesus at all. But again, they're seeking to undermine his credibility with the people. And again, guilt by association is an outstanding tactic to use. But you know, having a posture of a Pharisee is just the wrong way to go through life, especially for a believer. I mean, if you've got the posture of finding fault, stay home. Really. You know, there's so many that just have this critical spirit that are looking to find fault with something instead of saying, well, what can I do to help make it better? Every time you're about to run somebody into the ground, just ask yourself, what can I do to help that person be the person God wants them to be? Anybody can fault find. Mere mercy. And when you're fault finding, it's a total manifestation of pride because in doing so, you fail to see that you're usually guilty to some degree of the very same thing you're accusing someone else of. You are what you are by the grace of God. I am what I am by the grace of God. I like what C.S. Lewis said. Whoops, I forgot to say this. The Pharisees found fault with Jesus' disciples. That's what they came to do. And so there it is. But I like what C.S. Lewis said. He said this in reference to self-righteous pride. He said, there's no fault which makes a man more unpopular than self-righteous pride, and no fault which we are more unconscious of in ourselves. Isn't that true? And the more we have it in ourselves, the more we dislike it in others. That's the blindness of it all. You know, the emphasis in the New Testament is for me not to find fault with you, but to take heed to myself, to make sure my own nose is clean, to make sure I'm humble before the Lord and seeking his face. That's really where the emphasis is. Now, these are unsaved individuals in our text, but they typify a self-righteous attitude that can exist within a church, and that's usually what destroys a church, is a haughty, self-righteous attitude, instead of, again, having the mindset How can I help? And self-righteousness is always hypocritical because we're just pitting our strengths against someone else's weakness. That's what we're doing. And when you're thinking pharisaically, again, you've forgotten the ditch you were dug from. And you're either going to condemn someone else or exalt yourself or both. And it stems from pride. The only reason you're doing that is because you think you're something when you're nothing. And this is why Paul, who was falsely accused by the Corinthian Corinthian, carnal Corinthian believers he led to the Lord. He said, but by the, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And this great tor- grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. But it wasn't I, it was the grace of God which was with me. I just took advantage of the resources that God gave me. I'm nothing special in myself. Nothing at all. So why did the Pharisees bring the accusation? Verses 3 and 4 tell us. When they come to the marketplace, they don't eat unless they wash. You know, Mark, Mark was written primarily for Gentile readers, and so he's explaining to the Gentiles who would read this gospel some of the things the Pharisees got all up in arms about. Now, when he says this in verses 3 and 4, he's, they're not saying that they're eating with dirty hands. 
The issue is the tradition of the elders. See, the Pharisees made the accusation based on the tradition of the elders. Verse 5, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? See, the, the Pharisees and a lot of religious Jews, not every Jew, but religious Jews, would not eat unless they washed their hands a certain way. And this was true when they returned from the marketplace because they might have touched something that was, quote, unclean or bumped into a Gentile of some kind and in their minds were defiled. Their main emphasis in going through life was, am I doing the right ritual? That's how they thought. Am I doing the right ritual? They were sticklers for these things. Here's the irony. I thought about this. If they were here just a couple days earlier, they would have saw, they would have saw 15,000 people get fed with loaves and fishes and no one washed their hands. I mean, but they were a couple days late and so they missed it. Good night. But again, the washing had nothing to do with washing with clean hands. It was all ritualistic stuff. I, I'm going to quote MacArthur. He says, this washing had nothing to do with clean, cleaning dirty hands, but with a ceremonial rinsing. Ceremony involves someone pouring water out of a jar into another's hands whose fingers must be pointed up. As long as the water dripped off the wrist, the person could proceed to the next step. He then had to have water poured over both hands with his fingers pointing down. Then reach, each hand had to be rubbed with the fist of the other hand. Lord have mercy, right? I mean, on and on we could go. I mean, here you got Jesus walking around, and by his hand, the blind could see, the lame could walk, lepers were cleansed, legion, or demons were cast out, and a crowd of 15,000 was fed by his ceremonially unwashed hands. And so they're up in arms here because there's a great scandal going on. These dudes of yours are not doing the ceremonial washing. And they are demanding an answer. Or they're going to get an answer, but it's not what they're expecting. You know, one of the things that I, I, we need to always keep in mind here, even as a local church, we've got to keep the main thing the main thing. When you bog down in a detail that doesn't mean anything, you ruin the main thing. You've got to keep the main thing the main thing, and washing your hands is not the main thing. Now, keep in mind the Jews had two sets of laws. There was the Pentateuch, there was the God-given law, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. And then there was all the oral traditions, and that's what the Pharisees are referring to here. And these oral traditions were tons. In fact, they were collected, they were written down 200 years later, it was put in the Mishnah. Then there was commentaries written on the Mishnah. That became the Talmud, which was, I think if I remember right, 563 volumes, pages and pages. And that's what these guys would, would study. And there were 65 pages specifically uh, directed at how to wash your hands properly. Wow. Junior, come here. Here, we're going to wash our hands now, four days later, you know. <laughs> I like, even, this is even what Rabbi Eliezer, who was around when Jesus walked the earth, said, if anyone expounds the scripture in opposition to the tradition, they would have no place in the world to come. See, this is the problem. This is what religion does. It puts fear on people. And you know, our world is filled with those who hold their religious traditions and certain practices. And the point Jesus is going to make here is your heart is not right with the Lord at all. They will give great attention to performing and doing things the right way. And yet... They're ignoring scripture and their heart is, as Jesus is going to say, far from them. You know, that was the religious system I grew up in. The Roman Catholic Church had traditions and had the scripture. And when push came to shove, the traditions were of higher authority than the scripture. That is their official position. But they were all about the rules. They didn't really care about where your heart was at. They just want to make sure you look good on the outside. You see, the problem is it's pretty hard to compare hearts because only God can see them. So let's drop a list of religious external activities and see who comes out on top. And the Pharisees always came out on top. They win every time. And so are these, like he says here, they had 
things for the washing of cups and pitchers and copper vessels and, and couches and all the rest of it. And so the bottom line, when someone is thinking pharisaically or religiously, is that they're going to take great care for outward cleanliness, and yet they're going to neglect the needs of the heart. And where is God focused at? The heart. The heart. So Jesus here is going to expose their hypocrisy, beginning in verse 6. Jesus answered and said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, hypocrites. Ooh, that's not very nice. As it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but the heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups, and many other such things you do. Then he said to them, All too well you reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your traditions. And so Jesus here cites scripture and calls them hypocrites. Now according to Dale Carnegie, this is not how you win friends and influence people. But according to Jesus, the truth isn't always pretty. And this isn't pretty at all. You know, this is what Isaiah prophesied of the nation of Israel in his day. The Lord says, these people come near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is made up of only of rules taught by men. So Jesus is taking the prophecy of Isaiah and applying it to the Pharisees. He says, well, did he prophesy concerning you? And so Jesus openly calls them hypocrites. And the worst form of hypocrisy is that which carries its self-deception to the point where one thinks he's really doing what he actually pretends to be doing. And so Jesus here's enemies are hypocrites. But he didn't even brand them himself. He really used scripture to do it. And it's interesting, Jesus did nothing to defend his disciples. He didn't make that the issue at all. He turned it around right on them and said, well, let's talk about you. He didn't begin to debate with them about washings. You know, there's a big difference between tradition and truth. Tradition is outward, truth is inward. Tradition has to do with ritual, truth has to do with reality. Tradition is something you keep, truth is something that keeps you. And notice Jesus didn't say here, hey, listen, as long as you're sincere, it's okay. He didn't say that. You can hold those traditions as long as you're sincere. You know, this is something that increasingly the generation in which we live in has a hard time grasping. If something isn't true to the word of God, God says it's not worship. It's not worship. Because we live in a day and age and say, well, listen, he's really sincere. Well, I'm glad he's sincere, but he's sincerely wrong because God dictates the parameters and the standard for worship. Jesus told the woman of Samaria, God is a spirit and those who worship him, notice it says must worship him in spirit and truth. It's not optional. God is God. And this is a principle here. Honoring God with your lips means nothing How's that for a typo? People, if it is not heartfelt. Honoring God with your lips means nothing it should be if it is not heartfelt. So one, there has to be sincerity behind it. But number two, this is important. Honoring God with your lips means nothing if it's not true to God's word. You know, acceptable worship rests on what is put forth in God's word. It's shaped and controlled by God's word. God is dictating what it means to worship in, and if it's not true, regardless of your sincerity... God doesn't accept it. In fact, what does he say? In verse, we're going to get here, but, well, it says, in vain they worship me. In vain. Vain means worthless. It means empty. It's empty worship. There's nothing there. Absolutely nothing there. And yet in their own minds, they're worshiping God. See, the evidence of their vain worship, which God does not receive, includes this. They teach his doctrines, the commandments of men. Verse 7, And in vain they worship me, 
It's empty, it's meaningless, because they teach as doctrines the commandments of men. You know, of men there is in the subjective genitive, it means it's their ideas. It's their ideas. And someone will say, well, don't these people mean well? Well, I'm not here to say whether they mean well or not, and they might mean well. But to Jesus, is that the issue? You know, I always go back to King Saul in the Old Testament. God gave him a, a job to do. He says, I want you to destroy all the Amalekites. I want you to trash their animals, everything destroyed. Saul goes up there, and he, he saves the best of the sheep and the best of the things because they want to do some sacrificing. He's supposed to kill Agag, the king, and he keeps him alive. So prophet Samuel shows up and says, what's this bleeding of the sheep I hear in my ears? And he says this, why did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I've gone on the mission which the Lord sent me, and I brought back Agag, king of Amalek, and I utterly destroyed the Amalekites. And he goes on, blah, 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 and Samuel says, actually, he tells him to shut up. He says, I mean, has the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice? In other words, that's why, that was his justification of doing his own thing. I'm going to do this for God. As obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than your idea of sacrifice. And to heed to the Lord better than the fat of rams for rebellion. He called it rebellion. It is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is the iniquity and idolatry. Because you've rejected the word of the Lord, he's rejected you of being king. I mean, talk about lowering the boom. You know, I've heard over the years as a pastor, because people don't know what to say when they meet me, you know, I worship God my own way. I, you know, usually at a fishing boat on Sunday morning. And, and they, I don't know why they even have to tell me that, but they do sometimes. And, you know, frankly, I, it really doesn't matter what you come up with. You know why? Because God says, worship in me is according to what I say it is, not according to what you say it is. I mean, that's really what it is. If it's not according to God's word, it really doesn't matter where it takes place. So if you're convinced that you're worshiping God in a fishing boat, that's your business. But God says, if it's not according to the truth, I'm not going to accept it. Right? I'm not going to accept it. And what's bad about this group here is not only did they not do it as Pharisees, but they were leading the nation down the wrong road. And when you get to Matthew 23, Jesus is going to read the Pharisees the riot act and say that they've got a greater place of damnation in hell than everybody else. What else do we see as evidence? Laying aside the commandments of God in favor of man-made rules and traditions. That's what verse 8 says. For laying aside the commandments of God, you hold a tradition of men. And so I'm going to lay aside the commandments of God because I got my own ideas here that I think are more important than what God says. Now just think through this. This is, this is serious business as far as God is concerned. We kind of live in a day and age where it says, hey, you know, God's gracious and thank God he is. But that doesn't mean he doesn't have standards and that doesn't mean he doesn't dictate how it should be done. In verse 9, he says, you reject the commandments of God so you can keep your traditions. What verse 9 says? All too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your traditions. I mean, this is like one hammer after another. Religious traditions have two deadly things. They cast aside the word of God and they reject the word of God. I mean, think about it. Isn't this what Cain did? Cain knew what the right thing to do was, so what did he do? He came up with his own game plan. He said, look at these outstanding rutabagas. Outstanding, best there is. And Jesus said, or God said to him, I can't accept that. In fact, you know the right thing to do. And said, what did he do? He went and killed his brother. Because his brother did the right thing. And he didn't like that. He was exposed as a hypocrite. You know, it's one of the reasons that we take extra care here to give out the gospel clearly. You know, when it comes to the gospel, we can't decide what the gospel is or isn't because we live in a day and age where there's a lot of confusion about this. 
Paul says, moreover, I declare to you the gospel, which I preach to you. This is the message I preach. This is the one you received. This is the one in which you stand. This is the one in which you're saved. In fact, he goes on to say, this is the message I had to believe. For I delivered all to you first that I which also received. Paul had to believe the same message to get saved that we have to believe. And this is the message. It's not a call to repent from your sins or turn over a new leaf, to walk an aisle, to pray a prayer, to do jumping jacks, to take communion, whatever it is. It's what God did for you in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a message of good news and love from God to man. It's not a call to pull yourself up or anything else you might want to do. It. First of all, the gospel of salvation centers in a person. It's Jesus Christ and no one else. It's not the church. There's no baptism. There's no ritual. There's no confirmation. That's why it says how that Christ did this. And this is significant because of who Jesus is. Who is Jesus? He's the one mediator between God and man. He's the go-between. He's God who became a man, so he's the unique God-man. He could be God's representative to man and man's representative to God. And that's why he can make this very powerful statement, very exclusive. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And the issue is not, not only who Christ is, but what he did. It's his work. He died. He rose again. And the issue, of course, is what he accomplished in all that. Christ died for our sins. Our sins are what separated us from God. That's what had to be eliminated. The word for there means in the place of or on behalf of. Christ went to the cross on behalf of our sins, paying the penalty we deserve to pay because the sins had to be removed. And that's why John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He did it all. God can't pretend not to be God. Just like God has got standards of worship, God's got a holy righteous standard and he has to punish sin. He can't say, well, we'll just let this go. He can't. He has to be true to himself. But in love, who did he punish? His own son in our place. Amazing love. If you're going to understand the gospel and get saved, you need to understand that your sins, just like I need to understand my sins, were laid on Christ. And there on the cross of Calvary, when the whole world went dark, God's anger, judgment, punishment, wrath, and hatred for sin was poured out on the innocent one, the holy one, the unique God-man who loved you so much he willingly and lovingly did it so we could accept the horrors of hell, escape the horrors of hell. And that call, second last he, he, thing he said on that cross is, it is finished, paid in full. You know, when he was on that cross, amazingly, since he knows you perfectly inside and sideways, he called up every one of your sins. I mean, every one of them. Thousands and thousands and thousands. And he says, I'm now paying for them in full. And thankfully, he didn't stay dead. Three days later, he arose. He lives forevermore. And since the cross has satisfied the holy wrath of God, you simply have to do one thing to receive it. Acts 16, 31 says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And believe means to trust in. It means to have faith. It means to rely on. It means to put your confidence in something. And so when you put your confidence in Christ, since he got the job done, and since he can't lie... And since he lives forever, the very life he has is given to you freely as a gift with no strings attached. And the reason we're a stickler on that, there's several. One, it honors God because you worship him in spirit and truth. Secondly, how many people think they're saved and they're not because they've done something like walk an aisle, pray a prayer? Or they got confirmed and got baptized? Or someone says, well, I go to church, don't I? You're either a saint or an ain't. If you're a saint, you were saved by faith in Jesus Christ alone. You're not saved by baptism, communion, church membership, giving, serving, sacrifice. Anything else makes you an ain't. It's not Christ plus you in any way, shape, or form. Because religion muddies the water. Jesus says, your heart is far from me, in verse 6. Far. He didn't say it was relatively close. It's far from me. You know, when your heart is far from the Lord, the teaching that comes out of your mouth is going to be commensurate with your heart condition before the Lord. When you are far from the Lord, you're going to be far from his word, is the point he's making here. You know, and there's so many things that you know, even when the songs we sing here, you know, it's, it's not uncommon because of 
You know, we, for folks who want certain songs to be sung not because of the truth they contain, but for the emotional appeal of the melody. You know, we want doctrinally accurate songs here because if it isn't true, God isn't honored. And I'm all about a decent melody. I'm not, you know, there's, there's contemporary music I like, and there's songs I like. And there's some I don't. And there's some that are theologically terrible, even though they might have a nice tune. You know, some traditions aren't bad. It's just when you put them at the same level as Scripture or and replace Scripture with them, then they become bad. You turn it into a God thing, it becomes a bad thing. And there's been a lot of arguments over the years in congregations about things that God apparently has no opinion about. You know, I remember reading a pastor that was hip, making a big deal about rock bands versus organs. You know, and I've read the scriptures, and someone asked me once, what do you think about this? And I said, nothing's unclean in itself. Everyone's got to come to their own conviction. I'm not going to say that if a, there's nothing wrong with a guitar. It's not evil in itself or a massive drum set. Those things are not evil. It's like anything else is what you do with it. And Christ is actually going to get to that. But then he was joking about, let's sing the old hymns and the new songs. And, you know, this guy wants to say hallelujah once in a while. Oh, we can't have that. You know, or, I mean, it's amazing what you can get men out of shape on. I don't like the carpet. I don't like the color of the chairs. Why do they get green chairs? Let's make a mountain out of a molehill, right? I mean, we've got to keep the main thing the main thing, all right? If you want to recover the chairs, come talk to me. <laughs> I'm not doing pink, though. <laughs> so this is what... Now, Jesus here is going to use... Not only he's going to expose them in a very key area by giving them an example, beginning again in verse 9. He said them, All too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your traditions. Let me give you an example, verse 10. For Moses said, Honor your father and mother, and he who curses his father and mother, let him be put to death. But God said, But you say, if a man says to his father and mother, Whatever profit you might have received from me is Corban, that is a gift to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father and his mother, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition which you have handed down. And many such things you do. This is how Matthew records it, and I, I do this for a reason. It says, he, Jesus answered him and said, Why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and mother, and whoever speaks evil of his father or his mother, he must surely die. But you say, Whoever tells his father and mother whatever support I might have, have had from me is given to God, then that person doesn't have to honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you make void. It's interesting. Jesus, Matthew said, You broke the commandment of God. Here in Mark it says, he broke the commandment of Moses, which means the word of Moses was the word of God. So Jesus goes back to the Ten Commandments to show them their hypocrisy. And he quotes Exodus 12, 20, which says, Honor your father and mother. And Exodus 21, 17 says, Whoever curses his father or mother shall be put to death. So this is absolutely the will of God. But the Pharisees came up with a way to wiggle out of it. You know, everyone is to honor their parents. That was never rescinded. That's reiterated in the New Testament. You're always to respect your parents. Now, when you're out of the house, you certainly have to obey them. But you need to always honor and respect them and care for them. This is something that's important to God. That's why Jesus pointed this one out. He said, there's many such things you do here. I could give you all kinds, but this one here is a big deal to me, he's saying. And I'm going to point this one out. So they say Corbin. Now Corbin is simply an explanation and thus a vow that dictates the money or goods involved to God in the temple, etc. In other words, the money that I'm going to use to help my parents, I'm going to get out of this by saying Corbin, I'm going to dedicate it to God. But what they would do is they wouldn't do a thing with it. They wouldn't do a thing with it. See, technically, according to their tradition, you could use it as long as you want as long as you didn't use it for anything else. I mean, imagine saying, well, we'd like to help you, Mom and Dad, but the money that we could use to buy food for you, we've already dedicated to God, so, you know, sorry. 
But again, it's well documented they actually didn't give it to God. In fact, one commentator said, Corbin allowed a person to dedicate whatever he wanted to the Lord, but to continue to use them personally as long as he wanted, which is merely a handy way to pretend to be pious without giving up the personal use of what was dedicated. They pledged, they pledged them to God, but then they didn't do anything with it. The coming across is very pious, and yet Jesus says you're incredibly hard-hearted. Incredibly hard-hearted. They were heartless to the max. So in verse 13, this is a scathing conclusion. Making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down. So when you add or replace the Bible, you in practice make void the Bible and nullify its truth and power in your life. That's a powerful statement. It's a powerful statement. And notice he called it the word of God, verse 13. The word of God. And so if a plain divine commandment can be robbed of its authority by these Jews, the entire word of God is rendered empty by empty of its authority. This is why these traditions, and someone was just telling me, oh, this morning, that yesterday, there was a family get-together, and part of the family was out of town, and they go to a certain church, and their traditions ask Jesus in their heart, and they spent part of the day arguing about it. When you can't find the phrase in the Bible, and the Bible says, even 99 times in the book of John alone, it says to believe, and the whole purpose statement of John is to you understanding that Jesus is the Christ, and by believing, you have life in your name. But our tradition is, we're going to ask Jesus in our heart. Well, your tradition might cost someone eternal life. It says you make it void. I still remember the, one of the first surveys I did five years ago or four years ago in Alaska, whatever it was. A girl comes in, she's 20 years old, she's going back, to, she's lived in Alaska, she's going to Texas A&M or something, she sits down, takes a survey, went to Sunday school her whole life, she saw it, oh, she asked Jesus into her heart, and then she didn't understand the gospel. She understood the gospel, believed it, She's excited for a minute, and then a minute later, she gets really sad. I go, what's wrong? She was 22. Her brother, older brother was 26. She said, well, my older brother doesn't understand this, and, he, and he's walked away from God four years ago, and he said he's never coming back, so he's never going to hear this message like he should. This is her putting it all together in a matter of minutes, the importance of the correct response to the gospel, and even what the gospel is. So this is not a matter of semantics. This is big stuff. The stakes are high. See, the Pharisees manipulated the word of God to their own advantage. They found a theological loophole to allow them to violate the clear command of God. Isn't that something? Do you ever do that? Do you ever manipulate the word of God to find a loophole so you can do what your own do what you feel like doing to your own advantage? You know, believers, it's entirely possible, instead of having the mindset that says, Lord, how does this principle fit in my life for your glory? They look for perceived loopholes so they can do whatever they want and still feel okay about it. They're trying to salve their conscience in their rebellion. I've had conversations over the years when believers are currently in the middle of violating something that is a clear commandment in Scripture, will tell me that, well, God still accepts me and loves me. Well, yeah. Obviously, there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. He's always going to love you. I said, but is this what he would have you to do? He still loves me and accepts me. Don't tell me otherwise. And I said, well, you know, I said, I love and accept my children more than anything. Does that mean I let them do whatever they want? Is that what love does? Doesn't love rejoice in the truth? Doesn't love do what's best for another in light of eternity? So God in love is going to do what's best for you, which means the Bible says in Hebrews 12 that whom the Lord loves, he chastises. Not because he's punishing you, but because he loves you and wants what's best for you. But their whole mindset was, God loves me, I can do whatever I want. See, the question isn't, does God love you? The question is, do you love him? That's the issue here. And those that love him are going to love him in truth. In fact, that's what it means to walk by faith. 
If I'm looking for a loophole, it's all about me. If I'm walking by faith, trusting God, taking you at his word, I'm about honoring him. And I gotta trust him because I'd rather do what I feel like doing, right? Who here wants to do what they feel like doing? Don't we all? We have a very sad progression here. He says in verse seven, you teach the commandments of men. In verse eight, he says, you leave the commandments of God. Verse nine, he says, you reject it. And in verse 13, you say, you make it void. That's a powerful negative progression. But it's revealing where our hearts are at. So Jesus now clarifies, beginning in verse 14. When he called the multitudes to himself, he said to them, Hear me, everyone, and understand. There is nothing that enters a man from the outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are the things which defile a man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And so following this encounter with the Pharisees, Jesus offered clarity to the disciples and those gathered around him. He calls the crowd back to them. And he gives them the principle. This is the principle. Nothing that enters a man from the outside defiles him. It's what comes from the inside defiles him. Very simple principle. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Well, what is interesting here is that Jesus in entering the kingdom is also telling them that you can eat whatever you want. That's really his way of saying that. You know, frankly, there are no spirit, there's no spiritual relationship with, between what you eat and your relationship with God in the New Testament. Timothy made that clear. Paul to Timothy says, false teachers for people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving, which means you can eat dog food. It's on to the Lord if that's what you want to do, as long as you give God thanks. I mean, who cares? This is where people make mountains out of molehills. How, you know, years ago, 15 years ago, maybe even closer when I first got here, there was a couple really upset that people ate Big Macs every day and smoked because they were raised in a home where, you know what, you don't smoke and you don't eat Big Macs. And I said, you know, God could care less what you eat or what you smoke. Well, wait, that's a, wait, like, I need to clarify that. He does. <laughs> Jeez, that just didn't come out right. But, no. You know, there's a believer in our church. She's been part of the church for 20 years. She smokes like a chimney. And I had to say to one guy, what you're saying is that person can never be spiritual because they're always smoking. I said, you can never pick up a cigarette and you can be carnal to the core. It has nothing to do. Jesus said, it's not what goes in your mouth. That's why I eat my son-in-law's pastries. <laughs> to my own demise. But you know, it's interesting here. Then he clarifies for his disciples. Remember, there was a shift after the rejection of the nation and after the death of John the Baptist, Jesus shifted his ministry to instructing the disciples. So everything we've looked at, like even the, the feeding of the 5,000, has some instruction for the disciples in it, and it's no different here. Verse 17, when he entered a house away from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. So he said, are you also without understanding? Do you not perceive that what enters a man from the outside cannot defile him? Because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods. So Jesus declares that the heart is the source of all personal defilement. It has nothing to do with the stomach. Nothing to do with the stomach at all. And so in verse 20 through 23, he clarifies what the issue really is. What comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts and adulteries and fornications and murders and thefts and covetousness and wickedness and deceit and lewdness and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. These evil things come from within and defile a man. See, evil isn't something that comes from 
comes at me from out there. It comes from within me. The fruit of sin has its root in every human heart. That's why it's, impo- it's very possible to, live, to look very, very righteous on the outside and on the inside be totally unrighteous. Jeremiah 79, the heart is deceitful above all things. It's not moderately deceitful. It's deceitful above all things. And it's not moderately wicked. It's desperately wicked. Who can know it? The Lord does. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. The deadliest contamination is not what I touch. The deadliest contamination is what I think. That's why Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Sin always proceeds and has its genesis from within. Food ends up in the stomach. Sin begins in the heart. And so Jesus is saying, you know, your wickedness is not a result of anything external. Our sin, our problems, our dysfunctions do not ultimately result of bad company or bad examples or snares of the devil or what have you. Now, external things obviously are factors that bring out what's already on the inside. But the inside is the problem. Our wickedness is a result of a wicked heart. Evil's not out there, it's in here. It's not like I'm infected from poison from the inside. I got my own poison brewing, or or poison on the outside. I got my own poison brewing on the inside. And yet as mankind gets further away from God, society or individually, the blame is always placed on the outside. Romans 1 makes that clear. In our day and age, most people believe the problem is someone else. The reason I'm like this today is because of someone else. It's because of someone else. It's because of someone else. Jesus said, no, you're your own worst enemy. I mean, just to see it, you know, go to the nursery. You've got four 18 months old there and one toy. I want this. He's going to take it, and the other one's going to beat him up, and one's going to cry. And Didn't anyone teach him how to be selfish? Came with a package. In fact, if it weren't an adult in there, someone would murder the other one and not feel bad about it at all. I got my toy anyway. They don't have a conscience yet. Right? You know, I've told parents, I said, when your kids do something wrong, it's not because they were hanging out with Johnny. Johnny just brought out what was already in Jimmy. I mean, Johnny might be a bad influence, but Jimmy's hanging out with him for a reason. He wants to do what Johnny's doing. It ain't good. And just in case you're not sure who we are by nature, Jesus gives it to us straight here. Pride, thefts, deceit, lustful eye, murders, foolishness, evil thoughts, all comes from the heart. The heart. I'm going to describe some of these for you. I left it on there. I didn't have room for all of them, so... But just in case you want to know, he mentions evil thoughts first because the, the rest of these springboard off of this one. This is the root of all that follows. When an evil heart conjures up evil intentions, the evil person carries them out. Adultery, so illicit activity by married persons. Sexual activity by married persons. Fornication is the word translated in the Greek, pornea, first to any kind of illicit sexual activity. And you have murderers, which is a taking of an innocent life. And by the way, you're guilty of murder if you've hatred in your heart toward another person. That's what 1 John 3.15 says. A believer can hate another believer, and God says you're a murderer, murdering that person. Thefts, taking that which was not, or that which belongs to another for your own use. And though you might not, you know, everyone has stolen a cookie and they know they shouldn't have, and so we're all. But we steal glory from God, we steal all kinds of things that we wouldn't even be aware of or consider to be thievery. You got covetousness, which is an insatiable craving for that which belongs to someone else. We talked about envy and young people's class. And I said, if there's no comparison, there's no envy. The only reason I'm envious is because I compare myself to someone else and I want what they have. If I don't compare, and the illustrations are endless. I want her personality. I want his money. I want his car. I want, you know. 
And I explained to them too, and this is what we miss. You know, we see this outside and say, well, they got a really nice life. Well, you peel back the layers, guess what? It ain't so pretty. But I want to pick and choose. I want their car, I want their money, I want their popularity, I want their job. Uh, no, I'm sorry. It doesn't work that way. Wickedness, the word means malice, and refers to all the ways evil thoughts manifest themselves in a person's life. It's deliberate acts of meanness. It's all in your heart. Deceit, the word refers to cunning maneuvers designed to ensnare someone for one's own personal advantage. You have someone trying to work undercover to bring someone else down. Deception, dishonesty, cunning treachery, sneaky. I quit after that. Lewdness, the word refers to unrestrained, unbridled, shameless behavior. It's an entity that says, I'm going to do what I please, and I don't care what anyone thinks about it. Evil eye is envy. That's what he meant by an evil eyeball. Hebrew expression that speaks of envy and jealousy, looks at the blessings of another, desires them for itself. It is envious of another's prosperity, it should say. It believes God is withholding his best from you. It's characterized by unthankfulness. Blasphemy, injurious, defaming speech directed at either God or man. Gossip, incurring fall, and should be cursing. Did this late fall into the category? Then the ones I don't think that I made on your list, pride, the boastful exalting of oneself. An attitude says, look at me, see what I've done. No one else is as good or as great as I am. An overbearing attitude that is opposite of humility. Foolishness, the word refers to those who are morally and spiritually desensitized. That's what Proverbs brings out. They cannot see their sins, neither can they sense the Lord working in and around them. This kind of person, there is no spiritual illumination, there is no spiritual discernment. They do not know God and there is no desire to know him. The fool is said in his heart, there is no God. You know, what Jesus is making painfully clear here is that you can slapping a religious patch on a defiled heart doesn't make things right. You know, it's interesting, Jesus didn't tell the crowd after this, I got a 12-step program here to fix your heart. You know why? It's unfixable. You need a new one. These Jews outwardly did everything by the book, and yet they were still responsible for sending Jesus to the cross. Outwardly they were clean, inwardly they were defiled, and by nature we're no different. You know, that's why we, we say we're not religious here, we believe in relationship. There's only two words that come to this. Either you've got to keep doing to make it right, or it's already done through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. The, Bible says, the world says the problem's out there. See what you can do. The Bible says the problem's in your heart, and the answer is what Christ has done. Legalism. In legalism, we think better of ourselves than Jesus does. In salvation, we think of ourselves as Jesus does. Hopeless and helpless, sinners in desperate need of a Savior. So God doesn't ask you to clean up your life. He asks you to come to Jesus. Because he came to seek and to save you. And he gives you a new heart. You become a new creation in Christ. And the beauty about even the Christian life is that it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. I live the Christian life the same way I got saved. Not trying to pull myself up by my own bootstraps, but responding in love and faith as I abide in the Savior. And he transforms me from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. That's why we're, our responsibility is to, be, to behold the word of God he says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transforms in the passive voice. He does the transforming. We renew our minds. He gets all the glory because the Christian life is what Christ does in me and through me, not what I do in and of myself, which means I have nothing to boast in. In and myself, I'm evil to the core. In Christ, I'm perfectly accepted. And as he works in me and through me, he can be glorified as I seek to worship him in spirit and in truth. That's this whole thing in a nutshell right there. And so even as a church, you're going to be pharisaical or you're going to be humble. You're either going to be on a fault-finding mission or you're going to see what I can do to build others up and help them. We've got to keep the main thing the main thing. We're all a work in progress here. Man's looking at the outward appearance, but God's looking at our hearts, so let's make sure our hearts are right before the Lord. And trust him to give the increase for his glory. Let's pray.
Father, thank you for this passage, which is powerful, that exposes us for who we really are and reminds us of your amazing grace. Thank you for being a, the God of all grace and the God of all love, the God of all mercy. The God who cares for us above measure, that wants so much our best. I pray that our hearts would be humble before you, that be allowing the Spirit of God to take the Word of God and work in our hearts and transform us into the people that you want us to be by your grace because it's our privilege to worship you in spirit and in truth. Help us to just digest all these things, to understand them, to see how they fit in our lives, and may you make adjustments in our thinking for your glory. In Jesus' name.